vast distances in our universe are mind-boggling, and they cannot be denied. We know that light in a vacuum travels at some 300,000 kilometers per second. A light year is the distance that this light travels in one year. So if an object in space is 3 million light years away, then it would take light 3 million years to reach our eyes so we can see it. The Bible gives us a history of approximately 6,000 years for the whole universe. How do we see light that has allegedly traveled billions of years to reach our eyes if creation is only 6,000 years old? There's no doubt the universe is massively large, certainly billions of light years in extent. And it's clear we can see, with these large telescopes anyway, we can see into enormous distances in our universe. So the question really arises then, how do we see it? And we have to frame this in the creationist worldview framework. The Bible tells us that six or so, six to seven thousand years ago, God created the universe. He created everything on that day four during that six day creation week. How do we see it then? Because if light travels at the speed of light and only travels one light year per year. Therefore billions of light years should take light billions of years to travel to get here. Yet we see the nearby galaxies, we see the very distant galaxies. So how do you explain this? We see here this beautiful picture, cosmic pearls, this ring of pearls. This is a part of an explosion of a star that occurred, well we saw it in 1987. In fact, the uh, supernova is labelled 1987A. You see, a star exploded in a nearby uh, galaxy. It's a small galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud. It's 170,000 light years away. So on the surface, it looks like that that light should take 170,000 years to get here. How do we see it within a biblical time frame if, if, we've, if the universe has only been around for six or so thousand years? See, we see an image, we see it's, 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 it carries information, like that, that beautiful string of pearls. Even more with the problem, we see, say, for example, supernova in the nearby galaxy in Andromeda in M31. That's two and a half million light years away. So that means, again, on the surface, it should take that light two and a half million years to travel to Earth, yet we do see it. So we can't, we can't just say God created it that way because that would imply that the light carries false information with it. You know, like saying that God created all the light. It would take millions of years for that light to reach Earth, and that means all of the information, those pictures that we see in that light, would be false information, like events that never happened or something like that. So let's assume then that the distances in the universe are, are essentially what, what is measured, that they're accurate, they're correct, that the distances are large. Let's also assume that the speed of light is a constant, that it hasn't varied over time. And I believe even though there's different debate about this, particularly amongst creationists, that I believe there's not any strong evidence to suggest the speed of light has, has changed, appreciably anyway. Certainly that doesn't solve the problem then there's only one thing left in our equation, and that is time. Time is not an absolute. We know from Einstein's theory it's not an absolute. Time depends upon the observer, from the condition of the observer, the gravitational potential or the, the speed and so on. This is what relativity tells us. This is a hint, I suggest, that there's a solution to this problem. So is time an absolute or is it variable? Suppose we have a very accurate clock at sea level that clock will tick at a certain rate. Then, we calibrate another clock exactly as the first, but place it atop Mount Everest. We will see that the clock on top of the mountain runs at a slightly faster rate than the clock at sea level. This is called gravitational time dilation and is actually caused by the gravity of the Earth creating a depression, or well, in the fabric of space time actually runs downhill into the well and loses speed as it gets closer to the bottom. And so it is with time and the Earth. As one moves lower into the Earth's gravitational field, time actually runs more slowly. In my own work, I build clocks and oscillators. And in fact, I'm involved uh, with a future project with, with the International Space Station and the European Space Agency 
to measure the flow of time, the difference in the flow of time of a clock on the space station at 200 kilometer altitude and one on the Earth in our lab. And using atomic clocks and so on, we can see that change. GPS clocks uh, require a correction. 38 millionth of a second per day. It's very small, but the GPS clocks that are much higher up, about 20,000 kilometers in orbit around Earth, they tick just a little bit faster than clocks, the same type of clock would tick on Earth. The Bible gives a clear time frame of the age of the Earth. It has been calculated from the genealogical records in the Bible that the Earth is around 6,000 years old. So now we have the rhetorical age old question. If the Earth is only 6,000 years old, then how do we see starlight from distant galaxies? The solution is then, if in creation week, on that, particularly on day four, when God is creating the stars in the cosmos, if Earth clocks ticked much, much slower, in other words, time was much, flowed much, much slower than it does in the cosmos or does on the galaxies and stars as God is creating the cosmos, then there would be plenty of time in the cosmos for light to travel even the most, from the most distant objects to Earth, yet with only within 24 hours of that day four of creation week. So Adam, in that case, Adam opens his eyes on day six after he's created, the light has traveled to Earth and he can see it. So even if he had a big telescope, which he didn't, but if he did, he could have even seen some of those distant galaxies in the universe because there was plenty of time in terms of astronomical clocks for light to travel all the way to Earth. In recent times, there's been a, a couple of surveys. These are large-scale surveys of the galaxies in our universe. And, and there's the uh, two-degree galaxy redshift survey, which is uh, uh, where they image galaxies above and below the plane of our, our, our galaxy, measure the distance to them from their redshifts. Uh, a few hundred thousand galaxies and, and we see it, 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 it sort of mapped here and you can see in this map because at the center of this map at the apex is where the earth is or where our galaxy is and we're looking out in two directions from this but we can see that these galaxies now every point here is a, is a galaxy and they seem to be arranged on sort of roughly concentric shells like we're looking out, we're taking a slice only, but there's sort of these circles or rings you can see there. And that the other survey, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, also has taken over a few hundred thousand galaxies and taking the same sort of thing. And so it's looking in essentially the same direction as the, as the previous one. You can again, particularly in the upper section, you can see this concentric structure. So what that means is, that if this is correct, that it's like saying that our galaxy is towards the center of a, of a universe that has the other galaxies preferentially arranged on some concentric shells around us, sort of spherically circling around us, and we are at the center or near the center. So we get sort of the bird's eye view of the universe. We get to look all around us. I'm not suggesting geocentrism. I'm not suggesting going back to pre-Copernican days that everything revolves around the Earth. I'm simply saying that our galaxy is somewhere near the center of the universe. God is the creator. He created the laws of physics. He can do what he likes. But it's mentioned many times in the Bible, and Isaiah 48, 13 is a good example. It says he spread out the heavens, stretched them out. In other places it refers to it like a curtain or a tent, and stretched them out. So the implication there is that during the creation process, the universe was rapidly stretched out. Now we know today from looking at the red shifts of distant galaxies that the universe is expanding. Certainly we can say that in the past the universe expanded or was expanding. And so I think that's it. That's consistent with the biblical description. During creation week, as God rapidly stretched out the cosmos, like stretching the fabric of space itself, it caused the clocks to run slow, a relativistic effect of the clocks on Earth running very slow for that one day. And then at the end of that stretching process, when God stopped the stretching, the clocks all just ran at the same rate that they do today. So light would travel nearly all the way to Earth because 
over the 24 hours of that day of creation, there was millions, in fact, billions of years of astronomical time. So the, earth, the light had plenty of time to travel to Earth. And so now we look out at the cosmos and the light that we see today traveled during the creation day four, nearly all the way to Earth, or nearly all the way through into our galaxy, and then did just travel the last 6,000 light years of travel in the last 6,000 years, because Earth clocks now tick at the same rate that, that cosmic clocks do. My theory, which is a, uh, a theory based on uh, Einstein's theory of relativity, it's an extension of it, admittedly, it's, it's based on th the fact that the biblical history is true. Well, I suggest, since we're looking back in time, that we are actually looking back into creation week. And on day four, uh, it tells us in the Bible that God created those stars. So yeah, we can see in space, we can look back into space, we're looking back in time, and we can see stars being created. But I'm not suggesting they naturally happen. Well, some of them, there might be the right conditions for them to happen as part of God's uh, plan, the, the design, the laws of physics under the right conditions. But certainly the first stars had to be supernaturally created. And so, yeah, I think we can see creation as it's happening, so to speak. We can look back into creation week and see this process that is described in Genesis chapter 1. When we're looking at the cosmos, when we're trying to determine what happened in the past, this is not the same thing as doing some repeatable scientific measurement in a lab. You see, facts have to be interpreted and they have to be interpreted within the world or the world view within the belief system if you like of the observer of the of the researcher and in the case of the cosmos because we can only uh, receive light coming from the past we have to interpret it it's really historical science it's not the same thing as operational or experimental science and it's very weak because we can't interact with the universe. We can't send a signal and interact with it and get a response. And so we're really at the mercy of what we can receive and how we can interpret it. And we certainly, we are looking back into the past, but we have to learn to interpret that information correctly. In order to interpret that information, it largely depends on our assumptions what assumptions we put in, what assumptions we start with. If we start with biblical assumptions, we'll get a biblical answer. If we start with big bang, secular, atheistic assumptions, we'll get a secular answer. There is no God in the big bang. It's a, it's a naturalistic view. It's an attempt to eliminate God, eliminate the creator. And certainly Christians who say God used the big bang, they're doing a great disservice because God is not required by the Big Bang. Uh, the Big Bang people, they have developed their model in a totally secular, um, atheistic environment and there is no supernatural creation within the Big Bang. It's really a battle between humanistic worldview, or the humanistic worldview, and the, the biblical worldview. And it's not an argument over science versus religion or who has the best facts. Because as I mentioned, facts have to be interpreted. It's really this war of, of worldviews, a war of minds, a war of uh, capturing the minds, for, uh, you know, helping people to see what is the true history of our universe. And that's why there is such emotion involved in this. It's not just some cold clinical facts. This, this is truth and that is not truth. It's, that's why the debate rages so hot and heavy. With the advent of Darwinism came the excuse to deny a creator. Mixing science and God is not the issue. Rather, it is the way secular scientists approach their field of study and automatically rule out certain theories of origins. If we look at the Bible, he says that we can easily see that God created the whole universe, including this beautiful planet Earth. And he gives us in, in the Proverbs, he, he ah, essentially God warns us. He says that we should trust in him with all our heart and lean not to our own understanding. 
Now, I don't believe God for a minute doesn't want us to think and use our brain because he says to love him with our mind as well as our heart and soul. But he wants us to trust in him, but that we must base our thinking on the biblical text, on the history that we find recorded in the Bible. Thank you.